you can look out the window and you can see the signs of God's creation coming to life. We are reminded that it's springtime. We are reminded that it's a time of growth. We are reminded that it's a time of multiplication. And when I look at the Word of God, I see the very same thing that's supposed to happen in the church on a regular basis. And in the springtime, it's time for us to concentrate uh, not on ourselves, but concentrate on others and to reach out and to grow the kingdom of God. And that's certainly what we're trying to do as we look forward in the next couple of weeks to April the 7th. I want to refer you back to the book of Acts, the book of growth, uh, where we see the church growing rapidly in the New Testament. And I would remind you, as the church grows on that occasion, it's not something that should necessarily surprise us, but really how the church grows on that occasion is something that's very much unique. Because from Acts chapter 2 to Acts chapter 7, the church grows. Yeah, we know that. We see that. But what's interesting about the growth from Acts chapter 2 to Acts chapter 7 is the church grows, if you will, by reaching in. The church grows by reaching in. You see, the plan for spreading the gospel from Jesus to the apostles was to begin in Jerusalem. Basically, to preach to the Jews of the city. You remember in Acts 1 and verse 8, Jesus instructed the apostles, you shall receive power from the Holy Spirit when He's come upon you. And He said, you shall be witnesses to Me in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and to the uttermost parts of the world. And so the plan from Jesus was to start preaching in Jerusalem. And the preaching in Jerusalem led to phenomenal growth. We first see evidence of that in Acts chapter 2 and verse 41. We read about those who gladly received the Word. They were baptized, and that day uh, there were added to them about 3,000. And then uh, in Acts 4 and verse 4, many, believed in the, uh, and heard, many heard the Word and believed, and the number of men came to about 5,000. By the time you get to Acts 5 and verse 14, it just says the believers were increasingly added to the Lord. And when you get to chapter 6, In verse 7, the Word of God was multiplying greatly in Jerusalem. But again, the amazing thing about this growth is that it occurred by reaching in. Reaching in to their own people. Reaching in to those who were there in Jerusalem. But when we come to Acts chapter 8, when we come to Acts chapter 8, a great persecution is going to be led against the church by, of all people, The insiders, the Jews, who were in fact the target audience for the beginning growth of the church. And in Acts chapter 8, the church then makes a transition. And it's a transition that has changed the course of this world. Because the church transitions from reaching in to reaching out. In Acts chapter 8, the verses on the screen, verses 4 and 5, therefore they were scattered those who were Christians who were being persecuted were scattered, and they, it says they went everywhere preaching the word. And then Philip went down to the city of Samaria and preached Christ to them. You see, preaching to the Samaritans was the natural bridge to God's great plan. Not only according to Acts chapter one and verse eight, but also the message of the Great Commission. Uh, the verses that were read just a moment ago from Mark sixteen fifteen and sixteen for the Christians to go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. See, the Samaritans were half Jew and half Gentile in their racial descent. So this is the transition we see in Acts from reaching in to reaching out. And you say, well, why does that really matter to us today? Well, I think it has significant bearing on us today. Because, you know, sometimes I'm afraid we get way too consumed with reaching in. Um, the church in America, sometimes we get uh, complacent. We, we grow. Churches start in their infancy and, and they grow sometimes into the, the hundreds, the several hundreds. And in, in, in a place like a Roebuck Parkway, when we have several hundred members, sometimes it's easy for us to get complacent. It's easy for us to forget that our real mission is not reaching in. It's not serving self. But it's reaching out. It's reaching out to those who are around us. And you see, when a church decides to transition from reaching in and serving self to reaching out and serving others, that's when amazing things can happen. 
Now, I, I grant you, it was God's plan for them to reach in to begin with. I understand that. And we see phenomenal growth. See, God's plan is always the perfect plan. But when they get to Acts chapter 8 and the persecution comes along, it, it's God's providential way, I believe, for them to start reaching out. And from that moment on, the church was always reaching out to others. And you say, so why does this matter today? Well, I would submit to you that what made the church grow in the book of Acts some 2,000 years ago still makes the church grow today. A group of Christians that are committed to reaching out to others will yield the same results that we see in the book of Acts. And there are four lessons in a story in Acts the 8th chapter that I want to bring to your attention today that show us how they were reaching out. And uh, specifically, it shows us how we can make a difference in someone else's life. See, I really think that the reason you're here today is because you know that the church is more than about just us who are here today. Now, we may have some visitors, and I'm sure we do have some visitors. We always do have visitors on Sunday mornings at, at Roba Parkway. Uh, but today, I'm going to be preaching to our members. I'll go ahead and tell you that. If you're visiting today, uh, we're so glad you're here we, we really want you to come back on April 7th as well um, because we're going to be focused more on our visitors on that particular day. But I'm going to really preach to the church today. And, and what I really want to suggest to you today is the reason you're here, the reason you serve the Lord, you know that it's more than just about you. So stop looking at the church as a place to serve you and you start looking at the way you can serve others. And I want to show you today because I know you're concerned about other people. I know you love other people. I know that all of us know people who are not Christians. I want to show you today from the book of Acts, uh, Acts chapter 8, I want to show you how you can really make a difference in someone else's life. And there are four things in the story that begins in verse 26. Remember, Philip went down to Samaria to preach, and then the Spirit's going to call him to meet a man who is on a road from Gaza to Jerusalem, or really Jerusalem to Gaza, and, and, and something incredible happens. A change takes place in that man's life. A difference is made in that man's life. And we can follow the example of what we see right here in Acts the 8th chapter, and we can make a difference in someone else's life. Follow along as we read and study and take an outline, fill in the blanks, and let's see how we can make a difference in someone else's life today. The first thing you need to do if you're going to make a difference in someone else's life, find someone who's interested. I know that sounds so elementary, but it's really an important principle when we look at this story. Beginning in verse 26, reading two or three verses here together, it says, Now an angel of the Lord spoke to Philip, saying, Arise and go, to, go down toward the south along the road which goes down from Jerusalem to Gaza. This is desert. So he arose and he went, and behold, a man of Ethiopia, a eunuch of great authority under Candace, the queen of the Ethiopians, who had charge of all of her treasury, and had come to Jerusalem to, wor to worship, was returning and uh, sitting in the chariot. He was reading Isaiah the prophet. I think all of us in some ways might be somewhat envious of Philip on this occasion. Uh, God actually directs him to a lost soul. You know, we often sing, uh, lead me to some soul today. We talk about it. We sing about it. We pray about it. Lead me to some soul today. And here, God leads Philip to some soul. I want to remind you, though, about the idea of finding someone who's interested. Brother Jerry once said, someone is not in the phone book. And so, we're going to have to personalize the someone. Uh, we've got to be looking for someone. But remember, they may not be looking for us. And so, we've got to keep our eyes peeled. We're going to have to go after them and find them. It'll most likely be someone that crosses your path not just one time, but probably multiple times. It's that someone that you probably have contact with every day. It might be somebody you live with, someone in your own family, an extended family member, someone you go to school with, someone you work with, someone that lives across the street that you chat with when you go out to get your evening paper or the mail when you get home from work. It's, that's the someone we're talking about. Personalize it. Find someone who is interested. But I would remind you that you've got to be looking. You've got to be paying attention. 
the, rem- the Bible reminds us that finding something that is lost takes time. It takes effort. It takes patience. Luke, the 15th chapter, is a classic tale of searching for what is lost. In that chapter, we read about a lost sheep and a lost coin and eventually the lost boy. And in their own kind of ways, those things were very valuable and time was taken, effort was made to bring back that which was lost. And the New Testament instructs us, as we all know, to go into the world in search of the lost. Jesus tells a story in Acts, or rather in Luke, the 8th chapter, uh, and, and shows us how the seed needs to be sown into all the world, unto all the hearts of all people. But this parable also shows us that there are some who are more likely to receive the seed, the Word of God, than others. In Matthew, in Matthew chapter 7 and verse 6, we're even told, do not give what is holy to the dogs. Don't cast your pearls before the swine. When people won't listen, the Bible example is to shake the dust from our feet and basically to move on to someone else. Matthew chapter 10 and verse 14. See, all of these verses remind us of a principle that we're talking about here, and that is, you try to preach the gospel to everyone, but you hone in on those who seem interested. See, this man in Acts the 8th chapter, the Ethiopian eunuch, he reminds us that there are people out there who are showing signs of being interested in God. This man had traveled 1,500 miles one way from Ethiopia to Jerusalem just to worship God. On top of that, he wasn't satisfied by merely checking off that responsibility to go worship. Instead, as he's on his way back home, he continued to study the Scripture, as you can see there in verse 28. He could have been doing a number of other things, spending his time doing other things, but he was spending his time searching the Word of God. And that proves to us that he had a heart who was searching for God. I want to remind you, it might not be as simple as this story seems. God's Spirit today is not going to direct you in a miraculous sense to a man or a woman you know, sitting around studying the Bible. But if we'll keep our eyes open and we'll keep our eyes peeled, there are people who are showing signs of being interested in the Word of God. And we've just got to search for those people. There's a man today who's not only a Christian, but he's a preacher because someone took the time to search for him. A few years ago, there was a man who worked for the ambulance service up in Huntsville. His dream was to be a paramedic, but because of some physical limitations, he couldn't serve in that capacity. So he got a job with the ambulance service uh, to be a dispatcher. And you know, I mean, you're busy when you're on uh, the phone, but when you're not, you're just sitting around waiting. And one day, one day, while he was waiting on the next phone call to come in, he sat there at the desk and he opened up his Bible. And he was reading it. Another person, who was a Christian, walked by the desk there and he saw this man reading his Bible. And it was just after this example that you see here in Acts the 8th chapter, he said, do you understand what you're reading? He practically quoted the verse. He said, do you understand what you're reading? And the man standing there, or sitting there reading his Bible, he admitted that he needed help. Just like in this story. Well, the beautiful ending to this story, after numerous conversations, after numerous studies, this this person was brought to the Lord. He became a Christian. And today, he serves the Lord as a minister. And that's exactly the story you read about here in Acts the 8th chapter. Now, I, I, I think all of us would have the spiritual discipline to, if we see somebody reading the Bible that we are concerned about, that we know, that we love. Incidentally, these two people had a, a relationship. They, they worked together. They knew each other. So it was much easier for him to approach him. So, so look for someone that perhaps you've got a previous relationship with. And if you saw someone reading the Bible, it'd be really easy to walk up and say, you know, you, you, you understand it. And, and I would just imagine that it's very likely if they're reading their Bible, they might say, you know, I, I got some questions about this. Now, those are the perfect made opportunities. But the point I guess I'm making is, open your eyes. Be watching. Be looking. Find someone who is interested 
That's the place to start. The next thing to do is to allow God to speak to them through you. Look at verses 29, 30, and 31. The Spirit said to Philip, Go near and overtake his chariot. So Philip ran to him and heard him reading the prophet Isaiah and said, Do you understand what you're reading? He said, How can I unless someone guides me? And he asked Philip to come up and to sit with him. Again, it, it, it makes us feel a little envious uh, because how often do you walk up on that individual who is uh, reading or, or studying their Bible? Furthermore, how often do you find someone who might say, yeah, guide me, teach me. It usually doesn't happen that way. But that's not really the point I want to make here. The point is, when we look for someone who's interested, when we find someone who's interested, the point is, we want to allow God to speak to them through us. The Ethiopian eunuch demonstrates an attitude that I think is a little more common than we sometimes think. Here's a man who realized he didn't have all the answers. Jeremiah 10, 23 reminds us, Oh Lord, I know the way of man is not in himself. It's not in man who walks to direct his steps. He, he knew that there's a way which seems right to man, but the end thereof is the way of death. Proverbs 14 and verse 12. Here's a man who knew that, understood that. And he also realized that, you know, when you're talking about something as important as the most important thing, you may need some help. You may need some help in learning or understanding and so he realized he needed someone to guide him. He said, how can I, verse 31, unless someone guides me? Which brings us to the crucial part of the story that Philip plays. Because Philip becomes God's instrument. His microphone, if you will. So that the Ethiopian eunuch could not hear what the eunuch thought, but what God thought, what God said. And so he opened up the Word of God and he shared it with him. See, for the same reasons that the Ethiopian eunuch couldn't trust his own instincts, Philip couldn't trust his own instincts. He had to follow what God wanted him to do. And so it should be said today as uh, we look for people who are interested, when we find them, let's be careful that we don't give them the impression that we're just like everybody else in the world and that we're just doing what we think is right. So, so many people are just doing what they think is right. What they feel in their heart is right. And that's so convenient. It's so common. It's spread all over the world. We even see it down in Belize. People would say, I, this is what I think is right. And of course we see that here. It's that postmodern mindset that says, you know, what I think is, uh, is right, what you think is right, we'll just all agree to disagree. Make sure that you show someone that you're not speaking for yourself, you're speaking for God. And share God's Word with them. The third thing we need to do to make a difference in someone's life is to make sure we show them that Jesus is part of the plan. So when you get down to verse 32, watch what happens. The place of the Scripture which he read was this, He was led as a sheep to the slaughter, and as a lamb before its share is silent. So he opened not his mouth. In his humiliation, his justice was taken away, and who would declare his generation? For his life is taken from the earth. And then verses 34 and 35, So the eunuch answered Philip and said, I ask you, of whom does the prophet say this, of himself or some other man? And Philip opened his mouth and beginning at this Scripture, preached Jesus to him. Or preached the good news about Jesus. Is it possible in our desire to teach pure and unadulterated doctrine that we sometimes forget the most powerful part of the message. The story of Jesus dying on the cross. See, doctrine's important. We're not saying it's not. Doctrine's important because it determines what we do. You can't do right unless you're taught right. And so doctrine is important. But never let us lose sight of the powerful, heart-tugging story of Jesus' sacrifice on the cross. It's not an accident that Paul once described his work in the simplest of terms as we preach Christ crucified. We know he preached a lot more than just Christ crucified. He preached doctrine. But he preached Christ crucified. He had that in his preaching as well. You see, the Ethiopian eunuch shows us that everybody needs to hear the story of Jesus 
I know this because the Scriptures teach that everybody eventually sins. See, someone who sinned, like it says in Romans 3 and verse 10, there's none righteous, no, not one. Someone who sins, like it says in Romans 3.23, all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. Someone who not understands the wages of sin is death. They don't want to hear about doctrine. They want to hear about Jesus. Now, there's doctrine associated with Jesus. I understand that. There's doctrine associated with the preaching of Jesus. I understand that. But let's be real careful we don't get into a doctrinal debate with someone over their soul when we really need to start talking about Jesus. People need to hear that Jesus cares for them and loves them and knows them and wants to save them. And then we'll get to the doctrinal part once they understand that Jesus cares for them. You see, it says the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ the Lord. Let's make sure we remember that Jesus is part of the plan. See, the reason it's important for people to understand that Jesus is part of the plan is because we're going to answer to Him. We're going to stand before Him one day. More importantly, we're going to kneel before Him one day. We're going to bow our knee to Him. And we're going to confess to God. The important thing is we confess to God before we get to that point. And that's when we understand the need for Jesus in our life. As we teach people about Jesus... Let's make sure that we show them that He's not just the Savior of the world, but He's their Savior. He's their personal Savior. I think Paul understood this in Galatians 2 and verse 20. He said, I've been crucified with Christ. It's no longer I who live, but Christ lives in me. In the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God who loved me, Paul said, who loved me and gave Himself for me. To be able to share Jesus with someone You need to understand what He's done for you. And Paul understood that. You recall how the the eunuch read from Isaiah, the 53rd chapter, that great prophecy from Isaiah about how Jesus would suffer. Remember what it says in one of those verses? He was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement for our peace was upon Him. And by His stripes, we are healed. When the eunuch read those verses, he had to be wondering, how does this apply to me? You remember, he said to Philip, he didn't understand who this was about. The eunuch answered and said, Philip, I ask you, of whom does the prophet say this? Of himself or some other man? And that's when it says in verse 35, that Philip opened his mouth and beginning at this Scripture, preached Jesus to him. The ESV says, he told him the good news about Jesus. See, you can never become a part of God's family unless you understand you need Jesus. And I think that on this occasion, Philip, as he preached about Jesus, preached about the things that you do to come to Jesus, He told him about Jesus. He told him about the gift that Jesus had offered for him. He explained what that prophecy in Isaiah meant. That Jesus suffered for people, but He suffered for the eunuch. He died for him too. So remember, if you want to make a difference in someone's life, as you're finding that person that's interested, as you're allowing God to speak through you, make sure you talk about Jesus. And then one final thing. Explain God's plan for their salvation. When you get to verse 36, it says, Now as they went down the road, they came to some water. And the eunuch said, See, here is water. What hinders me from being baptized? The King James, New King James says, Then Philip said, If you believe with all your heart, you may. And he answered and he said, I believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. And so he commanded the chariot to stand still. And both Philip and the eunuch went down into the water and he baptized him. And when they came up out of the water... The Spirit of the Lord caught Philip away so that the eunuch saw him no more and he went on his way rejoicing. I've never met a person who calls himself a Christian who didn't believe that salvation involves the person, Jesus. But it's amazing to me that many who call themselves Christians don't believe salvation involves the plan of Jesus. 
I said a moment ago that when someone realizes they're in sin, they don't want to hear about doctrine. They want to hear about the man who can take their sins away. That's true. There's the personal aspect of Jesus dying on the cross for every one of us. There is that heart-tugging story of His sacrifice, His love, His pain and His agony. That's part of the story. But we've got to understand how that applies to us. That's the story about the person Jesus, but... Remember, there is salvation that, is only com- that only comes through the plan of Jesus. Acts 8 shows us that God's plan for salvation goes beyond just hearing about Jesus. Furthermore, it shows us that it goes beyond just believing about Jesus. It goes beyond just confessing about Jesus. Hearing and believing and confessing are good. They're part of the plan, but it's not going far enough. Acts 8 shows us there's water in the plan to save man's soul. So we're reminded that preaching Jesus involves preaching about baptism. Because as the Ethiopian eunuch heard Philip preach, he understood the pressing need to be baptized. It's interesting as they're going down the road and he's teaching about Jesus. Undoubtedly, he taught him about baptism as well. Because when they come to the place where there was water, the eunuch didn't stop and say, well... I need to stop and I need to confess Jesus so I can be saved. He didn't stop and say, you know, I need to just make some changes in my life. I need to repent so I can be saved. He didn't stop and say, you know, I'm going to stop right here and I'm going to pray a sinner's prayer. He stopped and he said, see, here's water. What hinders me from being baptized? And so Philip preached Jesus to him and he preached the plan that Jesus shared with the world to believe and be baptized so that we can be saved. The Bible tells us, the Bible teaches us that we're not saved at the point of belief. We're not saved at the point of repentance. We're not saved at the point of prayer. We're saved at the point of our baptism into Christ. 1 Peter 3.21 even says the light figure or the antitype now saves us. Uh, We're told in Acts 2.38 that we should repent and be baptized for the forgiveness of sins. We're told in Acts 22 and verse 16 that we should arise and that we should be baptized and wash away our sins, calling on the name of the Lord. And so be sure to make a difference in someone's life. You not only cultivate a relationship, you find someone who's interested You allow God to speak to them through you. Not only tell them about Jesus, but be sure and tell the simple New Testament plan for the remission of sins. And I would submit to you, you'll make the biggest difference in that person's life. And someday, one day, they'll be able to stand before God's judgment bar Perhaps we can only envision, look across the way and make eye contact with you and see you. And you'll be able to know the thanksgiving, the gratefulness that they'll have at that time for what you have done for them. Taking the time to give them the most important message that a man or a woman can have today. And that is the message about Jesus. It really makes a difference in our lives. Notice that when Philip finds this man, the Ethiopian eunuch, Acts 8 verse 30, he finds him searching. And when he leaves him, he leaves him celebrating. And what happened in between makes all the difference in the world for the Ethiopian eunuch's soul. And I would submit to you, the relatives, the friends, the contacts, the neighbors, the co-workers, the schoolmates that we all have, They need to find what will make a difference in their life. There are people out there searching. And we want to find them. And we want to leave them celebrating. Because we want them to experience what God has in store for them. The opportunity to become His child. The opportunity to rise, to walk in newness of life as we obey the Gospel. And to know that our sins are behind us. They're removed from us. They're forgiven. And now we're God's children. There are people out there that want that. And let's find them. 
Let's work to that cause. Perhaps you're here today and you understand I'm in no condition to celebrate. Perhaps you see the story here and you say, you know, what that man did is what I need to do. Perhaps you're not a Christian. We've rehearsed the plan that God has for us to forgive us of our sins. We've concentrated a little bit more on the baptismal part of that plan. But if you've read and studied the Word of God, you've heard about the Lord Jesus. And we ask you today, do you believe that He's the Son of God? Jesus said, unless you believe that I am He, in other words, the Son of God, you'll die in your sins. John 8, 8 verse 24. Jesus says, unless you repent, you'll perish. Luke 13, and verse 3. Jesus said, unless you confess Me before men, I can't confess you before My Father who's in heaven. Matthew 10, 32, and 33. Jesus said, He who believes and is baptized will be saved. Perhaps you say, you know, that's the plan. Right there. You know, those are all straight out of the Bible, incidentally. Incidentally, all those statements Jesus made, John 8, 24, Luke 13, 3, Matthew 10, 32, and 33, Mark 16, and verse 16. I didn't tell you what I want you to do. I've told you what Jesus tells you to do. And you say, you know, that's it. That's the plan. And I want to come and I want to obey it today. We want to invite you to do that. Perhaps you've come, yet something has happened in your life. Perhaps sin has come back into your life. Perhaps complacency. Uh, perhaps uh, confusion. Perhaps you're discouraged. and You haven't been serving the way you need to serve. Perhaps you've got caught up in that mode of thinking that the church is for you. The church is supposed to serve you. And you've forgotten that you, you're part of the church to reach out, not to reach in. And perhaps you understand that and you want to make some changes and you, you want to be restored to the cause of Christianity as we see in the New Testament, reaching out. If you need to respond today, we want to assist you. We'd ask you to come right now as together we stand and as we sing.